Hey everyone, welcome, hey. <laughs> welcome to Art Tech number eight. Um, it's crazy that we've done eight of these already. I feel like we just had this idea like a week ago. It's and already eight months. <laughs> yeah. It's already eight months. <laughs> um, <laughs> so today we have something um, a, a little bit different than what we've done before. We're going to be talking with, um, let me introduce our guest. Um, Today we're going to be talking with Jawan Brown. Hi, Jawan. Um, Jawan and I work together at Very, which is an IoT consultancy, and we're both software engineers there. Um, and recently, I was able to um, travel up to New York City, which is where Jawan is based out of. He's an artist and um, a software engineer in New York City. Um, and I was able to travel up there and meet him. And that's why I learned that he had all this amazing um, artwork that deals with um, you know, kind of big ideas incorporates um, also algorithms and, you know, digital spaces, um, digital environments. And it just sounded like a really, really freaking cool um, concept. So he's here to talk to us a little bit about his art and his process. Um, and he's going to kind of walk us through some of his projects. Um, Joanne, can you tell us just a little bit to start about um, kind of your background and how you sort of ended up in this art world with all of the, these kind of engineering um, influences. Uh, sure thing. So where do I start? I guess I've always sort of tried to find uh, some medium of, of self-expression like throughout my life. I think um, as a kid, I wrote like a ton of poetry until probably about halfway through college um, and sort of later in high school until like today, I still make a lot of music um, like beats and other things. Sometimes I go so far as to put myself on a, a record. Um, I think that visual art for me really started um, in the middle of the pandemic last year, honestly, uh, as a way to sort of reclaim the beauty that was being sort of held back for me by not being able to go out into the world. Um, and it's been really transformative for me. I feel like it's been, uh, it's become something I see as like a superpower because um, I think we all wanna live lives that we think of as beautiful. I think part of the reason uh, we all work so hard and do so many things is to have a life that we think of as good or true or beautiful. Um, and realizing that I could create a world, a beautiful world for myself, um, changed the way that I, I look at everything sort of radically and untied me from the need to do so many other things or have so many other things in order to have beauty in my life. That's really cool. Yeah, that, that's interesting because it, cor it sounds like it kind of corresponds with like, when you talk about like seeing, you know, missing out on some of the beauty of, in the world during the pandemic. Um, but then discovering this kind of digital art form because uh, so many of us were more immersed in digital spaces, you know, um, during that time. So it's like that sort of becomes your your environment and maybe where you draw inspiration from. Um, can you tell me, so the first thing that you told me um, about art-wise was about um, pieces you were doing that were like generative, um, that you were using algorithms to create. Can you explain that a little bit? Like, how does that work exactly? <laughs> sure thing. So there's a ton of, there's, I, I, I have some pieces that will go over sort of some of the different ways that I've, 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 I've done this, but there's really been um, a lot of different approaches in that um, I have written sort of uh, style transfer uh, algorithms that use uh, sort of machine learning libraries to take an aesthetic like the form or colors or whatever from one thing and sort of impose it on another. Um, and there are also programs I've used uh, like Runway ML is a really great suite of machine learning tools for sort of hobbyists, I guess, to make things where you can train a data set on something. Um, recently I did that with uh, statuary and statues and then train it until it's, it, it's sort of has a competition between a generator of images and a judge of images until the judge thinks that the new things are real um, and belong to the the rest of the work that we put in. So those are are sort of the high level sort of 
really crazy like machine learning things like that. And then I think the entire, a lot of my artistic process um, has more recently started to involve physical things, but for the most of the last like year and a half or something has been um, using my iPad as sort of like a central operating system or something. Uh, I have this app called Procreate, which Katie's daughter also has. It's a really uh -huh. great app. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that when you think about making art with uh, technology, specifically with computers, uh, you need to have an operating system. You have to have somewhere where you can do a lot of sort of basic tasks um, and Procreate's been really, really awesome for that. So I really recommend that to anybody that's looking to get into this space. Sounds amazing. <laughs> so um, did you find any other any other usage for, a, for the algorithm for machine learning? Yes and no. I think right now I've been playing around a lot with with art. I think I've helped I've helped my friends. I found use cases for other people that I'm not using. Um, I've helped some of my friends that are working on business projects and things like that figure out how they can cut down on design and advertising um, and a lot of other costs by taking copy or images or assets they already have and training machine learning models. Uh, so that they can either generate like text and copy um, to use in their marketing materials or or assets that are different than what they created before, but still have the same sort of um, their their brand attached to it. I, this sounds <laughs> right. I'm, so I'm I'm really excited to get into like the meat and potatoes of this. Um, or tofu and potatoes, if you don't eat meat. And um, so we kind of put like a teaser out earlier today that we were going to have something a little bit different. Um, and I think, Juwan, you said that you were okay with us sharing out the link to what you're about to show us afterwards so that everybody can go in and kind of explore um, on your own. Um, so we'll have that link available um, after, after the stream today. It'll be up with the video and everything. Um, also, if you have questions, um, while we're going through this, feel free to post them in the chat. We'll um, pop them up so Joan can see them and um, and kind of answer them as we go. And we'll also save a few minutes at the end for um, for some like last questions, some questions. too. So yeah. Um, all right. So we are going to turn it over to Joan. Um, and here we go. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And I'm, do I should I turn my camera off or should I leave it on? You can leave it up on. To you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And so I'm going to share my screen with you guys and hopefully show you something cool. Um, can you see it? Awesome, you can. So this is a gallery that I have sort of put together for tonight. Um, it's a virtual gallery. If you're joining on your iPad or your phone or something, um, you can download the Art Placer app, and I'll show you very briefly. You can sort of immerse yourself even more in this experience by clicking on something uh, when you see it, if you like it, and um, looking at it in AR uh, in your own home so that we have a virtual experience and an augmented experience. In any case, uh, let's just get right to it. So, welcome to my gallery. Um, the title of this exhibit is Worlding and Simulacra. I know that's uh, a lot of words. I, I'm hoping to um, give you guys an understanding of what those things mean for me uh, by the end of the talk. But at a high level, worlding is just like the way that you know you make the world around you. It really is the idea that the world is a thing that you make um, against the background of like the earth or whatever thing there is that you don't really pay attention to maybe um with that being said uh i'll take you guys into the first room of the gallery and start talking about some of the works in here so this room is really about light um and a little bit about life um a lot of these pieces reflect things i've been thinking about lately like um electromagnetism and energy and vibes and vibrations and frequencies. Um, 
I've been really fascinated with the idea that everything that we can see, um, every color that we perceive is, is really light coming into your eyes, whether it's radiating out uh, or being reflected. Um, things that you see in the real world most of the time are uh, reflecting light from the sun. So you're seeing like the frequency that it comes off of, uh, of that object and how those atoms sort of like give off a vibe, you know, like when you're seeing color, you're literally seeing vibes and uh, that's really beautiful and, and powerful to me. Um, I will, there are, there's a lot of art. So I invite you to sort of go through the gallery on your own when you have the time. Um, I'll focus on a couple of pieces in each room, but I really wanna leave room for you guys to explore and ask questions and make comments. So uh, I'll touch on this piece at the end of the room um, before we head to the next, um, just to explain how it's related to everything else and what inspired it. So this piece uh, is called Light Bearer, which is uh, the basically the, the meaning of the word phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is a Greek word. The Latin word is uh, a little scarier in the West. It's Lucifer. Um, it's the thing that gives off light, uh, gives off light. And learning about phosphorus was really cool um, because it's a thing that all life needs. Um, and it's a thing that life can't exist without. Um, and so I had been thinking about the origins of life as well. Um, and in making this, these are a lot of these are symbols of what phosphorus means to me, which is life and, and sort of the release of energy. Phosphorus uh, you find in every, every living cell. Uh, some don't even use photosynthesis. Some plants, uh, not plants, some bacteria, uh, they use a pigment like the one in your eyes that catches the light to to really to to make its energy. Um, and so this is really me reimagining sort of cave painting in the digital world, um, like depicting early life and the things that were really valuable to humans. Um, similarly, this work. Uh, which is called Living Loop, looks like maybe a worm, maybe like a living thing. It really is um, uh, sort of a strand of DNA. This is a, this fold sort of making this S wrapping over shape is, a, is, is really common in the way that our, uh, our, our DNA sort of folds in the higher level structures. And thinking about that same sort of what if cave painting were done with all the knowledge that we have today, like what would we make? I think, uh, at least for me, this is uh, an example of the sort of things I would make. Um, the last one I'll talk about in this room, I guess is is the, the first one. Uh, pretty sure this is called Photon. Um, yep. And I was really inspired by the works of painters that have used uh, a lot of abstraction and um, color in their work to convey emotion. I think realizing that everything that we see is really like a vibration of energy. Um, thinking about the way that color can evoke emotion and evoke feeling in us has been something that I've tried to do with my work most recently. And this is uh, some of the most recent work that I've done. Uh, and I believe I made this stuff last week. Um, but it's really to give you the sense of, of how light sort of you know, overwhelms us and, and reflects off of us this shining white thing that hits the substance and then turns into something that, that can be really like perceived and felt. Um, and that's, that's really where a lot of these things um, stem from. So I don't know if we have any comments or questions. Um, we have one question um, yeah. from CJ Godfrey. He says, um, would love to know the tech stack. What does the technical architecture look like when creating something amazing like this? <laughs> so one thing, I'll get to that. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have some pieces that really will help me sort of get to that. Uh, I think it's really abstract, right? A lot of these, there's, there's different things happening. Like I said, my main operating system really is Procreate. Um, so a lot of the work that you see in there is just straight up uh, me on Procreate with my Apple Pencil just going at it. 
there are some other things that involve a much more complicated tech stack. Um, but I, I, I think I'll, I'll get to that when, when they sort of show up. Um, but that's a great question. Thank you, uh, CJ. We've got one more here um, yep. from Marina Tassi. Um, yeah. I hope I said your name correctly. How do you think the digital medium affects the inspiration? Do you think you would have envisioned this differently in a physical medium? I like this question. That's a really good question, Marina. Um, I think um, Marina's also my girlfriend. She's full of great questions. <laughs> um, Hi, I think, Marina. <laughs> I think that um, it would be really different if you made it in, in real life, right? Uh, or in, in a physical world. Um, when you look at, when you look at um, the work in here, what I've really tried to do is give the impression of radiant light. Um, and it's not just an impression, it's real. When you, when you look at a color on a painting, let's say like if you go to the, the chapel that uh, Mark Rothko designed, the, those large uh, dark red paintings for, you're looking at the way light from the sun um, reflects off of those paintings. Um, I think here, what I really wanted to get across, the crazy thing about looking at technology, looking at visuals in a, in a digital format, is that the light is is actually radiating this is actually energy being like pushed into your eyes it doesn't come from somewhere else um and that's one of the things i tried to get across um in making these like for example this this uh work is called electron i'm pretty sure uh, electric there we go and the idea is looking at these these radiating beams of light which you can't really you can have glow in the dark paint, but there's not really like radiant paint. Paint is a pigment uh, and all pigments, just like our eyes, which are really made of pigment, um, light hits it and something reflects off of it. So it would be totally different, I believe. But yeah, that was a great question. Are there any more? No? Yes, no? Um, oh, we got another question from, um, let's see. The Vulcan House. I also hope that it is uh, that I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but sorry, I, I had us muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. About that. Um, yeah. So, do you feel it's possible to raise the vibration of AI through your art? It's a really interesting question. Um, yes and no. I think literally on a physical level, doing anything, um, energy is never destroyed or created; it's just transferred. I think doing things like this uh, really does shift our collective energy towards thinking about AI, at least on a surface level, if not the concept of it, then the form. Yeah. Uh, I think those are all the questions, if I am looking at this correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go into the next room. And I'll be able to get more into the questions about tech stacks and other stuff as well. So starting out this room, these are some paintings that I've made recently, some digital artworks that I personally really love. Um, the, the one that you see that is sort of the largest is, is called um, Devotion. Um, I think that a lot of the idea of what I what I mean when I say worlding is about taking the world that you're that surrounds you, taking the earth, the material, the substance, the people, um, and figuring out how to make a coherent self or how to make a coherent world more than more than a self out of all these little things. It's like you think about, uh, for example the rosettes uh, that are sort of drawn on here and the curves, the, the burning in these candles, the face that you can sort of clearly see in the bottom right. Um, these, are, these are about really in terms of the process, how I see things and make meaning out of them. I think um, After Dusk, which is the painting that is to the left, is something that I made uh, just looking out of the same window I look out of uh, every night and I saw the moon in a really, really beautiful way. And I, I think artists sort of have to follow their obsessions and just following that obsession, I ended up with something that really didn't 
imitate the real world, but it did reflect um, how how I saw things. And I think that a lot of worlding is about developing a way to see things. Um, if if we don't sort of make that in ourselves, we're doomed to only experience the world through the eyes of other people or through the sensibilities of other people. Um, we have a question, I think. Um, let's see, what is the potential? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we, if you're ready, we can post. We've got a couple questions here, actually. OK. OK. Um, from CJ Godfrey, uh, piggybacking off that, what are just your thoughts on AI in the art world? Do you feel the technology limits creativity? <laughs> I've thought about this a lot. I think um, no, not at all. Um, when you think about what art and technology are, uh, they're really similar. Um, the word art comes from the Latin word ars, which is a translation of the Greek word techni. Um, and the word techni means skill. When we think about technology, we think about uh, at least the one of the definitions of technology, I can't say how you think, um, is application of uh, scientific knowledge to the world. Um, and when you think about art, um, you think about like a product or process of creation and art can be anything, right? I think that art is about using tools to become expressive. And that's what I, I think I really mean by, by worlding is um, we have, we just have things lying around. Like you have this pen, you know, like how do you, this pen is a technology. I can use it to write. I could use it as a sculpture. I could like, put it upside down or something, put it in my ear and say that's a fashion statement. Um, worlding is about how we take things that may not, that we don't see the life in necessarily and, and breathe ourselves into them. And I think that um, technology and art are what you call product process words. Like art can be a process, art can be a, a product, technology can be a process, it's an application. Um, but the difference for me is really that art is the way is the way that we use our skills that we use technologies to express um, ourselves. And so, when you figure out how to use something, whether that's your words, your your visuals, um, your code, to not just do whatever, but to express you, I think that that that's what art is. Um, do we have uh, some more? Really. Yeah, that was a really nice way of, of framing that. Like you put yourself into something and it becomes art. It doesn't necessarily matter what the object is or where it would be categorized. I never thought then. about it that way. Yeah, that's really beautiful. <laughs> um, we've got a couple more questions. I'm going to put two up in a row. Um, these are from Emmanuel uh, Osinlana. What is the potential for AI to appreciate beauty, truth? Is this form of subjectivity limited to human consciousness? And then he ha he says, my question put differently, can only humans engage in worlding? Wow. These are big <laughs> questions. These are wow. big questions. Wow. Um, that, I think, <laughs> I don't think that uh, I can necessarily know until I see, um, so yes and no. I think that, Beauty is about what we find pleasing. Um, I think beauty and sort of like trying to make it sort of strict is like the experience that we have when we interact with something and it's, um, and it's just enjoyable. We just like it when you see a form and you're like, I like that. It's, it's that simple, it's that complicated. Um, I don't know how much computers can like things, but I do know that when I train a neural network, for example, that I'm, giving it things that have no meaning at first. And it's sort of making meaning out of those things together, uh, what you call sort of unsupervised learning. And so I think in that sense that we're getting to a place where art, uh, where technology really can sort of um, engage in worlding to the extent that we allow it to. Um, will it ever make a world for itself? Um, I maybe hope not, but 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, uh, sort of philosophically too. And I think that we're getting to a point where we really sort of have to ask what it means if technology makes a world and if we want to interact with that. Yeah, and that, that sort of lends itself also to the question of like, you know, there are those um, AI, you know, poetry generators or art generators screenplays. online. Yeah, screenplays. And, you know, it lends itself to that question of like, well, if, uh, if a piece of software writes a poem and it's new and it's beautiful and it's meaningful, is the software the artist or is the person who wrote the algorithm the artist, right? Like these are really big, like, where does that transfer uh, happen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, that could take us down a rabbit hole, I think. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a really good, I think when you think about that too, it's like, we, like I said, we use this pen to write stuff. Like, is the pen writing it or am I? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think this piece is uh, sort of helpfully uh, explicative or whatever uh, is this is called tessellation. Um, what this is, is process is you sort of seeing my process in, 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 a, in a couple of different ways. I use procreate to make this like I use a lot of other things. It's just like when I'm on my Mac, I'm using my Mac to do everything. So I took a lot of images that I generated uh, that I had made uh, in the in the recent weeks and used another application to put together um, a panorama. Really wanted to give the sense of making a tapestry, um, which I didn't present that piece in particular, but I, I, I had the idea to mess with it even more and have it fill up an entire screen. And I think when you look at something like this, you see my process in that sense that like, you can start with a single image. You can give it to another application uh, and do something to change it. Um, and then the output of that, you can transform even more. I could have just sort of put this here, you know, however many times, like 12 times and, uh, left it there, but I made changes to every row, uh, to sort of see what happens when I take the same thing and transform it over and over and over and over again. Um, and that really is, how I engage in my artistic process with digital art in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. So then moving on, um, we have one quick question, if you don't mind, from um, Emmanuel. How did you decide how much space each piece would take up in the digital room? I had this exact question. <laughs> It's a really good question uh, that I was asking myself over the last few days. Um, I, think, I think size is something that can draw attention to things. Um, I, I really tried to think about how I would experience or want to experience my own work if, if I were to put it in a physical space. Um, and for you guys at home, if you're taking your phone and clicking the images and sort of uh, viewing it in, in AR, um, for example, like if you, you know, you can do whatever, you can sort of see a certain scale in your home. Um, I think I wanted to, to, to put collections together to emphasize particular pieces of work uh, that I really like um, or that I'm really proud of or that I think are really helpful at explaining things. And there are other things that I wanted to be there for people to interact with, but that I don't necessarily need to draw so much attention to. Um, and sometimes that's tricky, right? Sometimes uh, an artist will put something in a song that unless you listen to it uh, many times, you're not gonna catch. There are some pieces in this, in this, in this gallery that uh, are small on purpose because I'm hoping that you miss it and also hoping that you don't miss it. Um, yeah, I hope that was a sort of helpful explanation. So on this, <laughs> this room is full of the collection that I have sort of received the most um, positive and sort of critical feedback on. Uh, it's called Non-Fungible Tulips. There's a, a link, nonfungibletulips.com. Uh, you can go to to see the entire collection. But this was 
a really big collection of NFTs that I had released in April, I think, um, sort of questioning the speculative nature of things in the digital world, uh, including NFTs. Um, I, if you all are familiar with like Dutch tulip mania, like they're like the whole idea of like the tulips not being that hard to grow, not being intrinsically valuable, but becoming super valuable because of the way that people interacted with them. Um, retrospectively, I think this is a great example of me asking the question of what it means to make a world because we see that uh, you see billions and billions of dollars of volume, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of volume going into the NFT space today. Um, and in similar spaces like SPACs and things like that, which are like, uh, I, I won't fully dive into that, but basically uh, assets that get listed on public markets uh, that may or may not uh, have the merit to be there. but. You know, you make a world. I think that the cool thing about uh, NFTs as they relate to sort of the idea of the metaverse um, is that we can make a world. We can make anything um, that humans like we make our world collectively and individually. And so if we decide collectively to make a world out of something, um, it can be real in the way that like the value of an NFT can be real in the way that like the metaverse can be real. Um, and as an aside, I wanted to touch on the, the metaverse idea, um, but I did this instead. So if for all of you at home asking, what's the metaverse, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, this right here. Um, in, in terms of like, uh, it, it's going to change, but this is really at a basic level on an artistic and technological level. This is the metaverse is where you can experience uh, and immerse yourself in, in virtual space um and augment your reality with things from that virtual digital space and engage with things and people and conversations uh in that space you could think of this entire um uh conversation we're having as the mvp the first stage of like the development of the metaverse like we have the ability to communicate um through Streamyard, through youtube we can be in the same virtual physical space um and interact with things in that space and and i think that that's that's really cool i think that there's a lot of sort of there's a really speculative nature to things as they become real but it's things are they're becoming realer and realer um, yeah and i think facebook is developing now their version of the metaverse they're putting all of their um all of their best on the on the oculus vr set that will be part of their of their version of the metaverse. That is interesting. I'm sure Facebook won't have any trouble or problems at all doing something that people will absolutely love. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, I think the Oculus really is, uh, is, is sort of like getting into that stage one. I'm really interested to see what Apple does just because Apple as a design company, I think will wait for someone to do something first. And then they're like, we could do that better. <laughs> So I can't wait to 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 we'll all buy it <laughs> and make them like a nine trillion dollar company. Um, we've got a couple more questions, if you don't mind, or if you want to talk about these pieces first, we can go master. Yeah, you know, this I you can look at non fungible tulips. Uh, you can buy non fungible tulips. Uh, <laughs> there's there's been a whole thing. I we don't need to focus on this. I, I'll answer some questions while we go into the next room. I absolutely love these tulips. Thank you. I want to go back in after and look at them more closely. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question is from CJ. We have AI, cloud, streaming, et cetera. What are some ways you keep up? Does this determine what the next art piece looks like or how you approach a new project? It's a good question. Um, yes and no. Um, I think that I think about art, I try to separate, sometimes I try to mesh it into thinking about forms and thinking about uh, ideas or substances. Um, sometimes the idea of a technology is what inspires the work, like non-fungible tulips were inspired really by the idea um, and also do sort of take on the form of NFTs. But I intend to explore more of sort of what 
form technology can take to us and in an artistic sense. Um, but a lot of the time it really is something that I integrate into my process. Like, how could I use this? How can I like take something from this app that isn't supposed to be used for art at all or something and, and make it art. Um, and I see, uh, it says cliff, uh, I, I thought that uh, CJ would want to be labeled as Cliff, but I, I, I will uh, I'll, I'll call you Cliff from now on. And then we have another question. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a question from Nick Ferry. If the places you've traveled around the world and the physical art you've seen along the way affected the way that you view slash the way that you approach art digitally? Yes. Um, this is a great question. Um, I lived with Nick when I lived in Rome a few years back, uh, and we went to a lot of really beautiful places together, like Florence and Uffizi and whatnot. And it's undeniable that the that I've I think worlding, making a world out of the things around you. I think for me, making an art world would have been impossible without uh, the artists that preceded me and being able to interact with and appreciate their work. Um, I, like I said, I did a lot of poetry and more musical things. Uh, I think I didn't start thinking a lot about visual art until I lived in Italy and I was sort of surrounded by it in like a real way in art that like isn't there. Sometimes you'll buy a painting to put in an office or a room to have something there. That's not what the art in, in a lot of these like churches and places are. It's art that people made to glorify ideas that they found to be the most important in the world. And I think you really get the sense of that and that even going from sort of the Renaissance through like Baroque, Rococo, Romanticism, like realism, post-impressionism, like cubism, et cetera, et cetera. Like Picasso is a big uh, influence on me. Like I think that like Rothko increasingly recently has been a big influence on the way that I do work, trying to enmesh my world with theirs and understand how I see beauty in their work and how I can like create beauty in my work um, has, has really been a big thing for me uh, as an artist. Um, but yeah, that was a great question, Nick. Thank you for asking. Um, this room that we have just entered is really talking about uh, or useful to talk about a lot of the stuff we already talked about because you guys have been asking really, really good questions. Um, this room in a lot of ways is about, um, is art that is centered on forms or conceptions of technology and math and things like that. Um, this one right here, I wanted to talk to you guys about, uh, Cliff just, from, just mentioned clouds, right? Um, when I made this several months ago, I was thinking about like cloud computing and clouds and how to have something take on the form of um, technology and and how and what that really means, uh, computer technology. Uh, and for me, computers do three things, maybe four. Um, and we can see that here. So this yellow sort of vial is storage. Um, computers store things. Um, this right here sort of looks like a server rack. Um, and that is compute power. Computers compute things. Computing can be simple or complex. It really just means changing stuff uh, or processing it. You know, like computers can do stuff to stuff. Whatever you store, you put some water in that bucket, you could make the computer a freezer and turn it into ice. Um, the last thing computers do is allow us to share. Uh, and I tried to sort of take the form of uh, networking on a really basic level um, here. So when we talk about making art with technology and how that affects my process, I think that it's recursive, which is a really uh, common word in, in the computer word world. But what it means is like something that keeps repeating itself. Um, and digital art is really a recursive process of starting from whatever, and then the fourth thing might be input, but I think storage is good. Um, you start with something, you change it, you compute it, you might share it to another application so that you can change it or so that it can be stored there, like posting something to Instagram or something, or putting it in another software program so that you can change it some more. So 
making art with technology, we're really just doing three or four things and finding a lot of different tools to do these three or four things. Um, but yeah, a lot of this is really um, about that. Some of this was inspired by me just thinking about the blockchain uh, a few months ago and thinking about NFTs and how uh, blocks and things like that work. Um, they're not technical explanations by any means. They really are meant to take the form so that you consider the form of like computing. Um, this one, this was fun. It was a, uh, almost a year ago, if not more. It's called Bit Eater. Uh, it really was just thinking about um, a thing, an entity, a living thing, and sort of how Emmanuel mentioned, uh, can, can AI world. I made this out of just ones and zeros, really. Almost everything you see here, uh, with the exception of some of the colors, uh, are just ones and zeros and ones and zeros uh, until it takes the form of a face. Um, and, you know, Sometimes I think a lot of a lot of this art sort of speaks for itself and it's more important how you interpret it than what I meant by it. I think for any art, the interpretation is more important than the intent. But the intent was me just thinking like, what does like what does a computer look like? And it's 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 a bit eater. Um, this last one is about space time and relativity and branching, uh, but <laughs> I'm not gonna get into it right now. Um, any questions before we move on to the next room? Let's see. No questions? Yeah, awesome. I think we're good to keep going. We'll keep an eye out for questions, though. Awesome. Hopefully that answered a good amount of you all's uh, technological questions, uh, or maybe not. That'd be fine, too. This room is a little bit of a transition here. We can see, um, like, this is just primary colors and bits. Uh, this piece, though, was maybe the second or third a uh, piece of art that I made, work of art that I made in Procreate. Um, it's called Social Distance. And it really hits on um, what I was going through when I started making digital art and what the experience was like for me. Like I said, like, I think art, art can be conceptual, but I like when art is just form and you just think about the form that a thing takes and how that affects you. Um, and it's really, there's, there's someone experiencing their whole world just through these screens, um, and through these, this, <laughs> this is really a zoom meeting <laughs> um, and, and, and how they have to literally create distance from themselves and the people they love or things they care about or things that they have to do. Um, you see money signs here, stocks sort of in an arrow stocks going up. And then you see sort of the outside world is burning and there are bad things happening. And like the inside world, if you're privileged enough to have a job where you can just be inside, like I thankfully am, you know, you were just experiencing the world like that. Um, this one is more recent, but it's really just about um, electromagnetism in the form. It's, it, it's almost a cave painting, almost a light painting. Uh, you see like a magnet and light radiating from something that looks like a tablet or something. And that's all there is to it. Um, moving on to some of this other work, I see there's some questions and I'll get to that in just one second. Um, these are more about the dark side of technology. Um, technology is really cool. We can do lots of things with it. Technology also has like a wild, massive um, emotional impact on us sometimes. And, and can really mess with the way that we experience the world in the ways that we, we might want to experience the world. This was really powerful for me to make. Um, it's called anxiety um, and it takes the form of emails. You can go back to it uh, another day, but I think that I said everything that I need to say about that one. <laughs> um, this is the form of an app like, like Snapchat um, that is, engineered to be as addictive as possible. And I'm pretty sure the title, yes, is addiction. Um, another, I'm most proud of art that speaks for itself, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and this is the winner of the content wars. So we have Hulu, Netflix, all these things that have replaced cable. Um, and some might argue that having um, an infinite appetite is detrimental to taste. And I think that that sum is, is me. Um, <laughs> this is really made, you see this digest, this is collage work uh, uh, of a lot of photos and a little bit of me changing things in Procreate. Um, you see this person's gastrointestinal tract, their appetite uh, has been divided up between streaming services um, that effectively make it so that your appetite never goes away. They want to endlessly fill you, which is why on the side, there's a little tapeworm here. Um, and the feeling that I got from that is literally that like the, 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 an excess of appetite is a lack of taste. Like if, if, if you can never be satisfied, it like, how do you develop taste when you're just looking for, for more to consume? Um, and I, like you see this person is, is it starts with a body under this, but there's, their skull, their eyes are gouging out. Their tongue, is literally, I know this is really visceral for some people, but that that was the intent. Their tongue has been cut off. You see content right here, cutting your tongue off. Your, your sense of taste being deprecated by the excess of content that we consume. Um, and yeah, so those were, we can move <laughs> Uh, but those were sort of the good side and the bad side of technology. Um, we've got one new question from Emmanuel. Is there a possibility to create an infinity room with an AI Sisyphus recursively worlding? All right. So you're going to have to explain what AI Sisyphus means. My short answer is yes, we can make anything, but <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> Maybe we'll get some um, further further explanation. We'll keep an eye out in the comments for. It. Yeah, I'd love, I love, I'd love to be able to answer that a little more. Oh. <laughs> okay, here um, we go. He says, "I yeah, got poetic." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is this idea, like for me, that um, like that idea of an AI Sisyphus is like something that's just like constantly like turning and turning and creating and creating yeah, yeah recursively and I, I wonder if that calls back to this idea of an endless appetite is just this like it's constantly turning itself. yeah mm -hmm. constantly like kind of turning and creating and sort of you know feeding oh yeah, he said exactly <laughs> yeah um, I couldn't be a couple AI and sisters in my head it's like <laughs> Yeah, that's a really, I think, a really interesting metaphor for some of the systems and machines that um, that we're creating today. You know, especially the ones that feed, you know, social media um, and and those things kind of that are represented in the, the dark side of technology that you showed. Yeah. Um, we've got one more new question from Marina. Does every piece have an intention? No. Some things are just form. Some things are just like. I don't know. I feel like as an artist, sometimes I'm just compelled to make things. I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. How's that beautiful to me? I have to do that. And then it's just like, cool. I made that. <laughs> just added another thing to, to, okay, how can I experience a beautiful world? And, and, and like, and like you, like you explained before, and we're giving it the value, like, like, like with a pen, we, we can decide what the pen is going to be for us. It can be like an art piece. It can be a tool. Uh, we're gi we're giving the the art the value by, by ourselves. Yeah, I agree. Um, going to uh, I'm sorry. I think Emmanuel asked something else. Or, um, yeah. A comment. I'm imagining machines that continue to create art after humanity's existence. Uh, yeah. And then we have um, from Marina. It's really interesting. Do you think this theoretical AI Sisyphus recursively worlding feeds into consumerism culture? If people watch it, yeah. So when you think about like an Instagram feed or Twitter, you could go on for what seems practically infinite. It is like discrete. It is finite. It has a bound. But like you go on forever on Instagram. I think you could do the same thing in like a virtual space. It's just like 
would you want to? And to Marina's point, I think that um, I don't always feel everything that I, I depict in my art, but I think this is something that I feel that uh, an excess of consumption uh, contributes to a lack of taste. So that's the, the short answer. Um, moving on uh, to, I'm sorry, were you saying something, Katie? Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was going to um, give you the, give you the screen back. I think we have time for another room, and then we have some other questions that we want to ask you um, at the end, if you've got time. Yeah, so I'll do a, because you guys can just go through this on your own. This room is about, the rest of this room is really about patterns. Um, patterns are really cool to me. Uh, patterns are pure form, and I look for them all the time. They help me think about things like, user interfaces and, and things like that. And some of them are really pretty uh, and they help me make a world. And you sort of see that over here. Um, we go from making and understanding the world to a place where I'm thinking about things like the scale of things, big and small, um, and how I see the world, this picture is music. It's the song Samba de Avion. Um, and it's sort of showing landing in Rio. And the song is about sort of landing in Rio on an airplane. Um, and moments that are really special to my life, like um, hanging out with the people that I care about the most, which this is a painting of the sunset that I watched uh, with some of my best friends a few months ago. So this room is just about the world that I live in. Um, and it leads into a little bit more about the world that I love, like maps and the ocean and the sea. Um, and as we get closer and closer, you start to see who I am and what I am. And that's why this room ends in a self portrait. Um, and it goes into in a room that's even deeper and sort of hidden away of who I am, uh, which I didn't depict a ton of in, in, in this, um, from the experience of uh, the various experiences of being a black person in America, this might have been the second thing I made after the social distance one, to me traveling the world, like that's a portrait of me in Cairo, uh, to the fact that I have feelings like everybody, I, I'm a person, I feel sad, I feel things sometimes. Um, and getting into sort of AI and generative art, these pieces were made by training uh, an algorithm on um, art from the Dogon period in Mali and some other places in West Africa. Um, and I think the idea, especially uh, when you think about African Americans um, experience in America and not necessarily having direct connections to their uh, original or quote unquote cultures, it's really interesting. I think black Americans do a lot of cultural generation. And so like, this is generative culture, which is sort of a, 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 a rhyme on that. Um, and if we have time, uh, I can briefly explain the last room, if that's all right with Katie and Guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So then we get in here and these are things I've been working on lately, things that I love, things that uh, have, I've been thinking. Um, the first one, this is called Pack It All. I think sometimes uh, when you play the game of capitalism, it can feel a little bit like playing Pac-Man, where like, who knows if Pac-Man wants to be inside of that little maze, right? But like, if he doesn't eat those pellets, uh, the monsters are gonna come get him and bad things are gonna happen. Um, and so that's just sort of a way to think about capitalism. I love maps. This is generative. All three of these are generative art using uh, deep learning or uh, like generative adversarial like convolutional neural networks. Um, this is based on the Catalan Atlas in 1375. This is a diamond uh, that was simulated not by like uh, a machine in a lab, but by a computer, uh, an algorithm trained on jewelry. I made these. I love vases. I love vessels. I love vases, uh, whatever, uh, containers. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite things that I own. I got in Crete um, and I have 
a lot more. Uh, I won't show you all of them, but like this one from uh, Turkey or Lebanon or something like that. Um, I love vases. I think it's so interesting to me. You look at all the cultures around the world uh, and look at art, which I've done in generating like 20,000 images on different culture data sets. Like you see masks and you see vases everywhere because people need ways to present themselves and we need places to put things. And I think our emotional connection to vases and vessels uh, really hasn't been explored enough. And just exploring how vessels can fill themselves with meaning or, or with feeling like desire, um, or this is more abstractly called a charged vessel. I think we can think of ourselves as vessels in the same way we can think of ourselves as masks. Um, this is DNA and Oshun, uh, who is an Orisha, um, which is a, uh, a sort of uh, Nigerian river goddess, um, the main one. There's a religion, um, my mom is Cuban, and so like uh, some of my family members practice a, a, a religion called Santeria, where uh, Oshun is, is worshiped and um, thinking about the connection between like Cuba and Africa and myself and everything uh, drew me to this. And then the last, the last bit of art we have for today, um, this is work that was inspired by some of the statuary that I generated. Um, this is called Quédate, uh, which is sort of asking a person to stay in Spanish. Um, this is made to evoke emotion and thinking about the past, the present, and the future. The idea that sometimes you just want someone to stay, but this this is a statue, it's frozen, it's still, uh, that whatever is already gone, they don't even have the hands to reach out. Um, this is about mortality and materiality. Um, it's made after like a bust of Napoleon and thinking about the idea that, you know, like what's immortality, what's the afterlife? Like, are we, some statue in some place, if we did a good job, do we have an afterlife that's radiant and glowing? Are we just dead uh, or, or, or do we sort of fade into the abyss? Um, lastly, this is, I don't like the title, it's a working title, Havana. Um, it's like heaven uh, or Havana with like an E um, and just thinking about uh, imagining a world where uh, Cuba is a different place where the things that um, sort of communism in our relation in their relationship with the U.S. and everything where the things that define that uh, are sort of stripped away. Uh, you don't see the color. You just see sort of like endless sky and opportunity, which is my hope for um, the Cuban people uh, one day. So that that's it. And I have room for questions and comments and uh, happy to talk about any of this stuff uh, again with anyone that's interested. But yeah, this is amazing. This was so cool, and I, I really love that it, it's also like there's a story in each of the pieces, but also like the layout kind of you know walking through it also feels like a story. You know where you start and where you end up. Um, also, also feels like a narrative. Um, we did have a couple other questions. Um, Robin asked. Do you believe minimalism is better? Mm, no, I think that um, form, form and aesthetics have a relationship where if you like a form, it's aesthetic. And if you, you know, like that, that's really all there is to it. I think minimalism arose out of reaction to the excesses of surrealism. Um, and, and the Dada movement uh, in, in sort of the after World War II. Um, but I don't know, like I like some minimalist work, but I think that there uh, there's room in the art world and in aesthetics and in the idea of beauty for everyone's idea of beauty. And that's why I called this uh, exhibition Worlding, because it's not just about what I think is beautiful. I've let you all see into my world a bit uh, more than I probably have ever let anyone. Um, but what's really important is how you make meaning out of the things that you saw. That's, that's the worlding of it. We have another one from CJ Godfrey. One thing I noticed is that being in the tech industry, there is usually a stereotype. If your tech, if your tech 
you're very logical and concise. Very rarely do we talk about the creativity, artistry side. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, like I said, you can do like three or four things with computers, but they're just like this pen. Think of your computer just like your pen. And you can write a, you can write a contract out to perform a purpose to do something. You can also write a poem that's like telling the world who you are using the language in the pen. And I, I hope that if nothing else, this inspires more people to make worlds, make whether it's in the metaverse uh, or on using some technology or in the real world, use whatever you have. All of these are technologies and, and use them to figure out how to make them expressive of yourself. And not do, just do, you have, do you have any tips for someone that want to make their first step as a digital artist and create this kind of creation like you just presented? What are the first thing that you think that person should do? Mm, I want to say download Procreate is my first thing. Um, I, I feel like y'all's daughter probably would also agree. Like, <laughs> she was. It's a, a good place to start. <laughs> um, yeah, I just being attentive, uh, making art. The one thing that has changed for me is uh, the things that have changed for me is I see the world so much more vividly now visually. Uh, whereas before I sort of saw in like words and labels and relationships, but words are really inadequate, um, especially mine. Um, start looking and seeing what you see. I think that's the most important thing. Download, procreate and draw the door in front of you, draw anything in front of you and see how that differs from what is real. And then you start to get a sense of what you see. Um, like I know I see the world vividly and in detail and with a lot of light and radiance. And I think you see that reflected in my art in a certain sense, but you know, it really is just as simple as finding your operating system, the place where you want, where you can do a lot of different things with art, like procreate, and then just start creating. And it's, it doesn't matter if you're recreating the world because you're really creating your world. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is really interesting. And this sort of, this conversation, um, that last question and that explanation sort of gets at the heart, I think, of why we started Art Tech in the first place is because there is, you know, 100% that stereotype that, you know, you're either like, you know, artistic. Left, left side of the brain, right yeah, side of the brain. Yeah, but, you know, in my experience, so I came from a humanities background. I studied literature um, and writing. And, you know, when I moved into tech, I found a lot of people were making similar moves for similar reasons. Last month, we talked with um, a machine learning specialist. Who was a musician. Who was a musician, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, you sort of stumble upon this connection that there's a lot of creativity in, you know, engineering and programming. There's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there that people don't see until they get a foot kind of in both worlds. Um, and so, you know, what, what we want to do is help people get a foot in both worlds if they want to. So whether you're coming from the art side or the tech side, what are some things, how can you blend these interests? What are some things that are accessible to you and, you know, that, that will allow you to put something out into the world, um, you know, which is scary to do. Um, so, you know, that it really kind of gets at the, the heart of like why why we wanted um, Joanne, you in particular, um, here on Art Tech with us because, you know, you're you're kind of living it, you know what I mean? You're you've got a foot in both worlds, but you're you're actually putting stuff out there into the into the universe. So um yeah, I mean just we're just really glad to have you on here and really appreciate you um showing us your um, your exhibit, your gallery. That was absolutely great, Joanne. Yeah, and, really cool. and remember that we talked before the before the show, and I I think I think did we did we uh, remind him to do that? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we ask every guest for three type or, for three different recommendations <laughs> by by the end of the show. It can be anything, 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 anything. It can be a show that you like. A, a blog that you recommend, a, a play that you that you watch, a, a, a video game, a, anything anything that you want to recommend to our viewer. Yeah. So the first thing, um, there is a series called The Shock of the New. Um, 
I can try to find the link and, and share it with you guys. I probably can find it pretty quickly, but the shock of the new, um, it's on YouTube. It's really about, um, how modernity in like postmodernism in an art sense has, a uh, has been responded to and has shaped itself. Um, the second thing is to learn what the word metamodernism means. Um, it's a it's a thing that I've been trying a concept I've been trying to sort of um, explore in a lot of my work that really is about um, reconciling uh, modernism, postmodernism, and tradition. And in that sense, like tradition, uh, sort of science and progress, reductivism, and like just endless critique. I'm trying to move past the bad parts of all of those things and like bring them together into something beautiful. Um, and the third thing um, was. To try to make someone else, this might be a little weird, or something else the subject in your story um, this week or, or at some point. Um, I think when we talk about worlding, you know, like a lot of it can sort of be related to like constructing a self, but I don't think it's just about constructing a self. I think it's about developing awareness and awareness of the world around you. Um, the other day, I lived two blocks from a beach. I went to the beach and took a video I haven't edited yet. Um, of just things, I, the ducks, the buildings, the water, some people, and changing the zoom of my camera lens. Um, even I even turned it on myself uh, to have as a video experience, like what's it like to not be the subject of the reality that you live in? Um, I think all too often we can be self-centered and, and, and self-purposed. And if we open up ourselves to the idea that like maybe we are the world that we live in, that we'll, we'll pay attention to a lot more things. Those are really awesome recommendations. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is um, we'll actually post those recommendations along with a link to this um, live stream on our website. It is um, arttechcollaborative.org. There we go. <laughs> Art Tech Collective, sorry, <laughs> Art Tech Collective. Um, dot org. So we'll have a link to, um, again, to this live stream and Juwan's recommendations up there. Um, we'll also, if it's okay with you, Juwan, we'll link to the um, gallery as well. So people can go and stroll around and um, look more closely at, at the stuff that we saw today. Um, I definitely am going to. Sure um, thing. Um, it'll be up for a limited amount of time. I haven't at least probably a, uh, a week or something like that, but I'll let you know when it'll come down. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to get that information and we'll take the link down after it's expired. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so, so much um, for coming on. We're really glad to have you. And um, I would love, I think we kind of talked about this a little bit um, a while back, but you know, the, the goal of, of art tech is always to actually make things and collaborate and get them out into the world. So um, I feel like a lot of the stuff that you talked about, the processes and the tools would really lend itself in a great way to um, a workshop. And, you know, that might have to be um, virtual as well, since there's some distance um, between Nashville and <laughs> New York, just a little bit. Um, like but hopefully we could work something that like that out. I would really love to experiment with some of the like generative art process or the algorithm we can like, break it down to so many different workshops yeah yeah, yeah. so um if you would be up for that we may be back in touch and, and have a a part two with juan <laughs> i'd be i'd be so happy to do that cool yeah. awesome um well for those of you who have hung out with us tonight thank you guys so so much um for for being here um i just want to kind of let everyone know that we're actively looking for um, people to help us move um, the organization forward. So we are starting small um, in, in Nashville. Um, we're looking, you know, hopefully toward the end of um, a lot of the, you know, COVID restrictions when we can safely gather and do workshops. Um, but in the meantime, um, we are really um, looking for someone who can help us out with things like social media or help organize events. Um, help, you know, work with speakers in advance. Um, so if anybody out there is interested, we would love to have you just reach out to us through the, um, through the, the website. website. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we would love to hear from you or on any of the social medias. 
And if you'd like to get our free speaker also on our website, oh, yeah. there is a form you can put your information in. We would love to send you a sticker. It's a cool one. You could put it on your water bottle, on your notebook, on your on, forehead, on your, on your laptop, on your forehead. Yeah. On your dog. And, and it's completely fine. It's completely fine. <laughs> Don't put it on your dog. It might, it might irritate their skin. Yeah. Our dog's really sweet. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, can I say well, one more thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, Thank you, Guy and Katie, so much for letting me do this and like uh, helping me not be terribly anxious about doing this <laughs> um, and, and just putting this together. This was so beautiful and well executed and awesome. And um, I'm looking forward to coming to the next talks as well. Awesome. Good. Well, and, and I guess we should thank everyone else as well for all of the Like this was great conversation and great questions um around the the topic so it you know it there's was just so many really things amazing. that i'm gonna keep yeah. thinking about today <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool well um thanks everyone once again um again don't hesitate to to reach out to us we would like to, you know hear from everybody um and if you are interested in helping out with any of um you know any of those roles that we talked about before um we would love to hear from you so Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks again. And thanks, Juwan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Guy. And thank you, Katie. And thank you, everybody, for coming. This was awesome. All right. See you later. Bye. See you guys.